then I'll get started. So I'm going to talk about the journey from reinforcement learning to embodied learning. And um, I want to start with a little example. So um, in 1996, um, the world champion at chess, Gary Kaspar, was uh, defeated for the first time in history by a computer called Deep Blue. And uh, looking at this picture, one of the things that kind of stands out to me, maybe stands out to you, is that even though there's a computer that's playing the chess game, there's still a person that's moving the pieces. And if we fast forward uh, 20 years, uh, in 2016, a computer beats the world champion at Go for the first time, at least at all. And again, if we look at the uh, the match, you can see that there's still a person that's moving the pieces. So this kind of gets us thinking, why is it that uh, we can have computers that excel at these cognitively demanding tasks, uh, beating world champions at these games that you know people have been playing for thousands of years, uh, but at the same time, uh, seemingly rudimentary tasks like moving the chess pieces or the go pieces still present a major challenge to us. So a lot of this comes down to you know, uh, an observation that people have made about AI for a very long time that's perhaps best uh, captured by the statement from Moravec's paradox. Uh, so Hans Moravec is a, a roboticist uh, who made this observation some time ago that uh, this is kind of his original phrasing and then I'll show a translation of that more recently by uh, Stephen Pinker. So Marvick wrote that we're all prodigious Olympians in perceptual and motor areas so good that we make the difficult look easy. Abstract thought, though, is a new trick, perhaps less than 100,000 years old. We have not yet mastered it. It is not all that intrinsically difficult. It just seems so when we do it. Uh, a more recent restatement of this by Stephen Pinker, the main lesson of 35 years of AI research is that the hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. The mental abilities of a four-year-old that we take for granted, recognizing a face, lifting a pencil, walking across a room, answering a question, in fact, solve some of the hardest engineering problems ever conceived. So basically what this says is that some of the things that we perceive as being easy to do, like picking up the chess pieces, are actually a lot harder. They just don't seem that hard to us because we're so good at them. Um, to, to give a more engineering-focused example, imagine uh, that your job is to get an oil tanker to sail halfway around the world. Well, building AI algorithms that will do the uh, path planning for the oil tanker automatically is not that hard, but you still probably want a human crew on board because if something goes wrong and someone needs to go and use a wrench to tighten something in the engine room, that kind of flexibility and adaptability, that's something where humans excel. So somewhat paradoxically, we don't necessarily need the humans to solve the difficult cognitively demanding task of like, you know, what, which, which path should the oil tanker take, but we need them to do the seemingly mundane things that really require the human flexibility. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today is the, the path that we should take to get to resourceful, flexible artificial intelligence. Um, how do we engineer a system that can deal with the unexpected, that can go into the engine room and fix the oil tanker? And um, a particular scenario that I often think about uh, when I think about this problem is uh, what happens if you're stranded on, a, on, uh, on an island? Like imagine the story of Robinson Crusoe, right? Robinson Crusoe was stranded and had to uh, use his resourcefulness to figure out how to build shelter and get food and that sort of thing. So what would it take to get an AI system to survive on an island by itself where anything could happen and there's no uh, help in sight? You have minimal external supervision about what to do. Unexpected situations arise that will require adaptation. You have to discover those solutions autonomously. So no one is going to like give you a simulator of the desert island or reset the environment for you so that you can try multiple times. And you have to stay alive long enough to discover them. So there are some pretty profound challenges that arise, many of which actually lie outside of the kind of uh, problems that we typically study in modern artificial intelligence. And humans are exceptionally good at this. And current AI systems are generally pretty bad at this. So certainly learning-based approaches bring us closer to being able to handle open world challenges, but this sort of adaptability and flexibility still remains a major difficulty. Okay, so some of you might be wondering at this point, well, what about reinforcement learning, right? Reinforcement learning is something that allows us to learn how to do stuff from experience, from feedback. So surely reinforcement learning offers us at least part of the solution to this. And in fact, there have been some pretty remarkable successes in reinforcement learning uh, in terms of uh, you know, playing video games, uh, playing Go, et cetera, and even robotic control tasks. But there's still a pretty huge gap between the kinds of success that we've seen in supervised learning, uh, you know, translating text uh, in open world settings, recognizing speech, recognizing objects and images, where the image could be anything taken from the internet, and the kind of domains where reinforcement learning has been successful. 
And this is not so much a gulf in terms of the task complexity, it's a gulf in terms of how open world the task is. So the kinds of domains where reinforcement learning has been most successful oftentimes are really closed world domains. So the, the Go playing bot doesn't really have to worry about you know, someone spilling coffee on the Go board and having to deal with that. Now, we could imagine taking reinforcement learning and uh, generalizing it to these kind of more open world settings. But with current methods, that's actually very difficult because reinforcement learning involves learning through trial and error, learning by interacting with, a, uh, with the environment, using that interaction to improve its policy, uh, throwing out the, the data that it collected, and interacting some more. And if you want the kind of generalization that we see in open world settings like ImageNet classification, that means that you need to collect an ImageNet size data set each round of this interaction. And that's not going to be practical. So even if we subscribe to the notion that reinforcement learning would allow us to tackle these challenges, and even there, there's some uh, problems that come up, but even then, simply bringing reinforcement learning to open world settings already presents uh, enormous difficulties. So um, what are we missing? Well, in many ways, what we're missing is the right way to deal with data. So a lot of the big successes in supervised learning really come down to being able to take huge data sets and train very large models on them. But when it comes to embodied uh, AI systems like robots, well, they need to be able to utilize data that gives them that open world generalization. And then after that, they need to be able to collect data in their particular environment, handling all those challenges I mentioned before, where they stay alive long enough to deal with the problem, deal with the world in a continual streaming setting where they don't have a simulator, they don't have some means to reset it, and, and basically handle all of those challenges. So these are really two of the big difficulties in bringing the success of machine learning to embodied systems. Getting that open world generalization without having to have an exorbitantly expensive interaction where you collect image net size data sets each time you update your model. And once you've done that, actually being able to adapt in realistic scenarios without the need for unrealistic assumptions like simulators and uh, resets. So where do we get data for embodied learning? Well, we get it from two places. We get it from prior experience. So even though Robinson Crusoe had to figure out a lot of things on, on his own, he wasn't born on the island, right? So he came to the situation with prior knowledge that was not exactly what he needed, but was close enough that it could get him started. And this is actually really, really important because if you have to figure out everything from scratch, you wouldn't get anywhere. Um, and the second one is autonomous exploration. So Robinson Crusoe could try things. If they didn't work, he could try something else. He could practice things. Um, but at the same time, he had to do all of this in the world as it really is. So he couldn't just go and try something really risky. If that would lead to injury, he had to be judicious in how he explored the environment, knowing that he has essentially one life to live. So both of these things are to some degree outside of the classic formulation of episodic reinforcement learning. Episodic reinforcement learning, the way that's classically formulated, doesn't really provide a way to handle prior experience. And uh, it doesn't really deal with a continual exploration setting. I mean, we could do continual exploration and, and that's fine, but the typical way that we evaluate these methods really is quite tightly situated in episodic environments. And oftentimes the methods are uh, rather specific to that. Okay, so here's the, the kind of recipe that I think would allow us one day to really deal with this issue of uh, open world uh, learning. First, we would have a big data set from past interaction. This is kind of like all the experience that uh, Robinson Crusoe had doing whatever else he had done in his life before he was stranded on the desert island. Uh, we use this experience to train the best possible initial model that we can get out of our past knowledge. So essentially, you're faced with some new problem. Um, you don't know exactly how to do it, but your past experience tells you something. So let's get the best possible initialization from that past experience. And then you would improve your initialization as much as you can through additional interaction. And both of these steps are actually very important. So if the problem is not too far from what you've done before, then maybe that initialization from prior data can already give you a very good solution. But if it's not uh, close enough to what you've done before, then this additional interaction is really important. But at the same time, the additional interaction itself needs to be informed by your prior experience. So even if your prior experience is not enough to tell you exactly how to do something, maybe it's enough to tell you what not to do. Like, you know, maybe Robinson Crusoe doesn't know how to build shelter on this island, but he knows that he shouldn't like jump off a cliff to do it because that's not going to be helpful, right? So there's a lot that you can bring in from prior knowledge, even if it doesn't tell you exactly how to solve the new problem of interest. So the uh, training from prior data 
needs to be able to leverage previously collected experience. And we're going to talk about how offline reinforcement learning can provide us part of the machinery for doing that. And the additional fine tuning uh, has to be autonomous and continual. It needs to be situated in real physical environments with all the constraints and difficulties that that entails. So I'm going to talk about four topics today. I'm going to talk about some fundamentals of offline RL. I'm going to talk about how offline RL can be used for embodied learning with robotic systems. Then uh, I'll take a little uh, detour to talk about autonomous online training. And then I'll put these things together and describe how offline RL pre-training and online fine tuning can be combined into a, a single robotic system. So let's start with some uh, basic uh, kind of uh, conceptual fundamentals. Um, so I'll, I'll first talk about just the offline stage. That's the stage where you're going to use prior data to get the best possible initialization. So here, we won't worry at all about the online stage. We'll just deal with the offline part. So what do we expect a good offline RL method to do? Well, this is something where I think there's actually a fair bit of confusion in the community. And one bit of, I guess, what I would call bad intuition is that uh, one might be tempted to think that, well, maybe it's a, it's a lot like imitation learning, right? So you have a starting point, you have a, a destination, and your data kind of tells you how to reach the destination from the starting point, and you basically want to copy the data. If you're lucky enough to have data like this, that, that's, of course, great. But in most cases, we want offline RL to do a little bit more than that. Although I will mention that in some cases, it is actually provably better to do offline RL than imitation learning, even when the data is near optimal. But more generally, the settings where we care about offline RL are ones where the data doesn't tell us precisely how to do the new task of interest, but we want to find the best possible execution for the new task that's sort of inside the data in some sense. So maybe your data goes to lots of different places, but parts uh, of different uh, trajectories in the data set can be recombined in some way to do something closer to uh, what you want for the new task. And that's kind of what we really want from offline RL. So, a very simple example that illustrates this is this stitching example that uh, we've used in some of our papers. If you have a trajectory that goes from A to B and you have a different trajectory that goes from B to C, well, that should be enough to go to figure out how to go from A to C. But of course, this is a, a very simplistic example. In reality, things are much more interleaved. So you can imagine having a kind of a, mic, a micro scale stitching example where you have many trajectories that are all highly suboptimal, but they're suboptimal in different ways. So if you combine the best parts of everything, then you might get a much better solution than if you had just copied the data. So in principle, it really should be possible to use offline RL to find solutions to new problems from prior data for other related tasks. And if you have a good offline RL method, you can take this idea much further and get near optimal policies from data that is highly suboptimal for the task that you're trying to solve. Okay, so let's go through a kind of a quick primer for how this works. And I'll try to give you just a kind of a taste for some of the challenges. I don't want to go too deep into algorithms here because you know this is a fairly broad talk, but I do want to give you a little bit of a sense for what sort of goes into designing these kinds of methods. Um, so first, a quick primer on off-policy reinforcement learning and specifically on uh, Q-learning. So in RL, you have agents that select actions that we denote with A, and the world react reacts with states, S. And the agent receives a reward, R of SA, and its goal is to find a policy, which is a conditional distribution of actions given states. So the, a good policy is one that maximizes the RL objective, meaning that it maximizes the expected cumulative reward over all time. And a very useful object for doing this is something called the Q function. So the Q function is a function of a state and action that tells you if you start in that state and then take that action and then follow the policy pi thereafter, what is the total reward that you will accumulate? And um, if you can recover the Q function for a particular policy, then you can always find a new policy that is at least as good or typically better by simply being greedy with respect to your Q function. So if your new policy takes an action with probability one, if it's the argmax of the Q function, it's guaranteed to be at least as good as your previous policy. And in fact, it'll be better unless you've actually converged to the optimal policy already. So this basically uh, immediately tells us how we can construct a, a proper reinforced learning algorithm called policy iteration, where we can take this idea even further and we can kind of skip the middleman and develop basically Q learning where in Q-learning, instead of actually constructing this policy, we directly uh, train for the optimal Q function by enforcing the Bellman optimality equation for all states and actions. So this is the Bellman optimality equation, and it, and it basically says that if you can find a Q function that is equal to the current reward plus the max over the next Q, that Q function will correspond to the optimal policy. And the intuition for why this is true is that, well, if your policy is the argmax, you plug the argmax into the Q, so you get a max, and that's basically where that comes from. 
So if you can just enforce this equation for all states and actions, then you will recover the optimal policy. Uh, and that's really great because nothing so far actually says that that action needs to come from your latest policy. You need to be able to evaluate the max on the right-hand side, but the A there could in principle come from anywhere. So this leads very naturally to an off-policy RL method where we simply minimize the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the Bellman optimality equation for all the states and actions that we've seen in our data set. Okay, so does this actually work as an offline RL method? Could we simply load up a data set of states and actions from our past experience and just minimize that difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side and get an effective policy? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is no. And the reason why this is a little difficult has to do with distributional shift. So to illustrate this, let me rewrite that Bellman optimality equation in a slightly different way. Let's say instead of a, a max on the right-hand side, I'll write it with an expected value, where the right-hand side is R plus the expected value under some distribution pi nu, which is going to be this argmax distribution. So I didn't actually change the equation. It's exactly the same equation. Uh, where pi nu is this argmax, but this just makes it a little bit more explicit that in order for this to work, the expected value of q under pi nu needs to be accurate. So we can say, well, is it going to be accurate? And to understand that, we need to understand how it's trained, right? So we have these labels, let's call them y for shorthand, and the objective for training q is to minimize the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side, but that difference is minimized under some distribution. And that distribution is the distribution that collected your data set. Let's call it pi beta, beta for behavior. So if you're minimizing some loss under a particular distribution, you would expect the loss to be low under that distribution, but it won't necessarily be low under some other distribution. So what that means is that you would expect good accuracy when pi beta is equal to pi nu. But of course, the whole point of doing reinforcement learning is that you're going to improve over pi beta. So you're going to find a pi nu that is better uh, than pi beta. So how often are they going to be equal? Well, usually not, unless pi beta is actually optimal, you're probably going to find a different pi nu. And even worse, the way that you're finding pi nu is by maximizing the Q function, which is more or less the recipe for producing adversarial examples. So adversarial examples, just to remind everybody, are produced by taking a model and optimizing with respect to the input of that model to get a particular label. And here you're taking a model, in this case, the Q function, and optimizing with respect to its inputs to get a large value. So Generally, for neural networks, you will be able to fool it into producing a large value, and then you'll think you have a great policy, but you actually don't. You're just exploiting flaws in your Q function by selecting actions that are just too different from the ones that it was trained on. And in fact, this agrees with the empirical evidence that we observe. So here's an experiment where we took a naive off-policy method on the half-cheetah task. Good performance on this task is about 10,000, but when we trained on it, we got you know, rewards around negative 250. But if we looked at the Q function, the Q function thought that it was getting you know, numbers like 10 to the seventh power. So the y-axis here is actually a log scale. So the Q, axis, the, the Q function thought that it was getting huge values, but in fact, it was getting very poor values, which is a pretty good indication that this exploitation, the separate examples problem was happening. So that's basically the core challenge in offline RL that we have to address. And there are a number of ways to address it. I'm not going to go into too much depth on algorithms, but I do want to give you a little bit of a taste of one method that we've developed that we've been using quite a bit that uh, greatly mitigates this problem, and that's called conservative Q-learning. So the problem is that this overestimation issue due to finding out of distribution actions that fool the Q function. So uh, intuitively, the way you can think about this is that if the green curve is the true function and the blue curve is the fit, well, the blue curve might be pretty accurate, but if it makes an error in the positive direction somewhere, that's the error, that, that, that's exactly the point that the maximization will pick up on. So intuitively what we can do is we can find those overestimated points and we can push them down. So this equation kind of shows how we're gonna do that. The second line is just the regular Q learning objective that's minimizing the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side. But then we've added this regularizer at the top, which finds a distribution mu for which the Q values are large, and then it minimizes those Q values. So intuitively mu is gonna find exactly those spurious peaks and then by adding those to the objective, the Q function will minimize them. So you can almost think of conservative Q learning as almost like a variant of adversarial training. Find those overestimated actions and then minimize their value. And um, this has a number of appealing theoretical properties. For example, you can actually provide a, a kind of a lower bound guarantee that says that you will not overestimate the true Q function. And it tends to work pretty well in practice. Now, of course, that's just one of the many principles that we could use to build offline RL methods. There are other principles that could be used, but they all kind of revolve around the same basic idea, 
we're going to use some kind of value-based method, either Q learning or Q function actor critic, and then we'll somehow fix the distributional shift problem. So this could be by using pessimism, like in conservative Q learning, where you essentially assume that you should minimize the value of out-of-distribution actions. It could be by somehow constraining your policy. So maybe if, if the issue is that the new policy is too different from the behavior policy, perhaps you can limit how different it can be. Um, and then there are other solutions that might even try to avoid out of distribution actions altogether by, for example, rewriting the Bellman backup so that you don't ever have to actually select actions that are not in the data set. And it turns out to be possible to do that as well. A particularly effective recent method we've developed that does this is called implicit Q learning or IQL. And there are lots of other interesting topics in offline RL. So if you're interested in this more, I would encourage you to check out some of the other work. Uh, model based offline RL is a very actively growing area. Um, you can develop a version of CQL that is model based. Model based offline RL also works really well with very large models like transformers. And we've done a bit of work on this. That's, that's very promising because if you have lots of prior data, it sort of makes sense that you'd want to throw the full power of scalable modern models at them. And there's also a lot of interesting stuff that you can do with multitask offline RL. And there's room for interesting ideas where you have data for many different tasks and you have to be selective about which data to use for which new task. So if you're interested in that, you can check out this paper called Conservative Data Sharing. But what I want to focus on for the rest of the talk is actually taking some of these ideas and bringing them to bear on embodied learning problems. And for that, I'll first talk about just a, a pure offline RL method in robotic settings, and then I'll talk about how we can add online fine tuning to it. So first, um, I'm going to change gears a little bit from talking about algorithms and instead ask, if we're going to do offline RL with robotic systems, what kind of data sets would we want? So let's say that you, you just uh, got a new robot in your lab and you want to get this robot to do something and you want to find a data set that, is, that you can use to sort of bootstrap that robot. So you're going to train the best possible initial model from some prior data set. What properties does that prior data set need to satisfy? You can almost think of this as a kind of image net for, for robots. Whatever new task you want to initialize, what kind of data do you need? Well, you probably want a data set that allows you to generalize over tasks because it's pretty unlikely that the task you want your robot to do is exactly the same as tasks that other people have done. So perhaps it would be a good idea if this data set has many different tasks so that you can hope to get some kind of generalization. Um, it would be really nice if this data set allows generalization over scenes. So if the, if the whole data set is collected in my lab, you probably wouldn't be able to use it in yours. You might even want generalization over robots. Maybe you want the data set to contain multiple different robots with similar morphologies. We'll leave this one for later. We're not, uh, we haven't really figured out how to do that really well, but I will talk about a data set that we've developed that addresses the other two points. So we call this uh, bridge data uh, because the idea is that you're going to have a data set of prior tasks that sort of bridges the generalization gap between your new robot for which you might have only a little bit of data and the prior data we've collected. And we'll restrict this to a very particular kind of robot. We'll use a Trosson Robotics Widow X arm, which is a low cost robotic arm. So we won't do cross robot generalization. We'll, we'll look at generalization across environments and across tasks. So the bridge data set is basically a large data set of manipulation tasks that are all collected in kind of kitchen themed environments. Now they're different kitchens. They're mostly actually toy kitchens for children because the robot here, the Widow X robot is uh, smaller than a human arm. So we have to have smaller objects and smaller kitchens, but there, there's a variety of these toy kitchens and uh, the data set illustrates a variety of different manipulation tasks. And then the kinds of questions we'll be interested in in with this data set is, well, can we leverage it to improve how well we can learn new tasks in new environments? So the data set contains 7,000 demonstrations, 10 different environments and 70 tasks, and it's really designed to be reusable by other researchers in new domains and for new tasks. So here's a, a scenario that we evaluated in the original bridge data paper, and this is for now just done with imitation learning. So there's no RL yet, I'll, but I'll get to the RL shortly. So here we have our bridge data, and we have a new target task. In this case, it's putting this brush in a pot that is in a new environment. So the task itself was not seen in the prior data and the environment was not seen. And what we're going to do is we're going to mix, let me just uh, show that again. We're going to mix the bridge data and a small amount of data from this uh, new task to solve uh, the new task more effectively. And we can show that we can solve this new task much oh. more effectively by including the bridge data. Um, here's another example of this. Uh, here we have this uh, sponging task uh, this is actually in a real kitchen. And again, same deal, all the prior data is in other environments and for other tasks. And uh, what, what, what we're studying in the paper is whether just a small amount of data for this target task, when combined with the bridge data, can make it possible for the robot to solve it. So if, it, if it's doing single task imitation without the bridge data, then it fails at the task. But if it includes the bridge data, then it succeeds. So um, 
That's, this was with imitation learning, but more recently, the question that we want to answer is, if we incorporate offline RL into this process, can we make this work significantly better? So that, that's actually what I'm, what I'm going to focus on. And the setup here is actually very simple. We're going to assign a task index to each of the tasks in the data set, and then we'll reserve the last task index for the new task that we're learning. So we'll first take all of the prior data in the bridge data set, and we'll pre-train a model with offline RL just to solve all the prior tasks. And that's basically a pre-training procedure. Uh, this is actually using a larger version of the bridge data set that we've since released that has uh, 12,000 demos instead of 7,000, but it's the same basic principle. So we get this task index condition policy. It basically takes in an index of the task to perform and it trains on the entire bridge data set. Now, we're not really concerned about how well this policy does on the bridge data tasks. What we're concerned with is can we use it to initialize the new task? So for the new task, we'll use that reserved last index uh, to uh, indicate the, the task that we want. And then we'll fine tune with uh, each batch sampled from the new task and a little chunk of it reserved for the, to keep recycling the bridge data so we don't forget uh, what happened before. And then we'll test at the end on how well we do on this new task. And we're going to evaluate different conditions with different levels of difficulty where the new task could either be similar to what's in the bridge data, it could be a similar task but in a new environment, or it could be an entirely new task in an entirely new environment. And what we'll be comparing to is uh, just using offline RL on the new task or using imitation learning. So these are this is actually all done with demonstration data. So in principle, imitation learning is actually a viable competitor here, but what we'll see is that offline RL ends up doing quite a bit better. So um, here uh, is an example of a task, uh, with, which is to put this uh, toy sweet potato on home plate. Let me just play that again. And here what we're testing what happens if you take 10 demos for the new task and then use imitation learning with the bridge data set to solve it. And 10 demos is, is not really enough to do this. But if we do this with RL, then it actually works. Um, here's another task, putting the knife in the pot. And this is an unseen task that was not present in the prior data. And again, with imitation learning with 10 demos, it starts to get the idea, like it picks up the knife, but it's not able to succeed. Whereas with offline RL, it does succeed, although it's a little bit messy. So let's look at some of the quantitative results. And I mentioned that there's these three levels of difficulty. So the first one is we take a task that was actually in the bridge data, like put the sushi in the pot, and we change the task. Maybe it involves new objects. In this case, it's a different sushi in a different pot. Uh, and in this case, we actually find that the offline RL pre-training and fine-tuning method, PTR, in, uh, in this case, is, is actually doing very well. CQL is just trading on the target uh, task. And then behavior cloning, fine-tune is, fine, is pre-training on the, on the bridge data, and zero shot is just trading on the target task. And you can see that PTR does quite a bit better than all of these. Here's a slightly harder setting. Here we have a task that was seen in the bridge data, opening a door, but now we need to uh, fine tune that task in a new setting. So it's a very different door in this case, like a microwave door. And again, we can see that PTR does um, significantly better than the baselines. And then here's the hardest setting. Here we have a task that was not seen in the prior data and it's an environment that was not seen in the prior data. And in this case, uh, PTR ended up doing quite a bit better than behavior cloning. I, I don't have the, all, the zero shot offline RL comparison here, but uh, it's it's also fairly bad. So uh, here you really need both offline RL and the pre-training procedure. And one of the things I want to emphasize with this is that the data here was really not collected specifically for offline RL. In fact, the data set was actually designed for imitation learning. So it's pretty interesting to see that an offline RL procedure does actually lead to pretty significant benefits in this case. All right. Um, so, so far we talked about only about offline training. But now let's talk a little bit about online uh, training and how that can be done under realistic conditions. One of the big challenges with learning autonomously in the real world in robotics is that without simulators and without some kind of instrumentation in the environment, it's pretty difficult to get a robot to try a task again and again. And let me show you a few videos to kind of illustrate what I mean. Um, here's a, a project that we did a few years back at Google where all of these robots are learning how to open doors. And well, one of the things you might notice is that they're doing a pretty good job of opening the door. So it's working decently well, that's good. But there's this person that has to go around and close the doors in between the tasks. Uh, why? Well, because they're learning how to open doors and not learning how to close them. So uh, for whatever task the robot is doing, if it, needs to, if it needs the environment to be reset so they can try again, that needs to be done somehow. More recently, my student Anusha Nagabandi uh, developed a model-based RL method to enable a robotic hand to manipulate multiple objects in the palm at the same time. And being a good engineer, she actually developed a less labor-intensive system where she programmed an entire other robot 
to perform the reset. So, you know, of course that's convenient and it made the system work, but it's pretty unrealistic to expect that in the real world, you would have like another robot or a person that can fix things up every time the robot tries something just so you could try again. So this might seem like a fairly mundane challenge, but I think in fact, it actually highlights one of the big limitations on how we tend to think about reinforcement learning. We tend to make a set of assumptions uh, that allow us to really isolate the problem, but in doing so, we often miss major challenges that arise in real embodied learning in the real world. It's basically real embodied learning is not just reinforcement learning. There's a lot more that goes into it. So for this particular challenge with, uh, with resets, here's one way that we can think about addressing it. Let's say that we have a particular task that we want the robot to do. Like maybe we needed to put the cup in the coffee machine. Well, if it tries the task and it fails, maybe it drops the cup, perhaps a person could go in and fix things up. But if we don't want to require that, then maybe the situation where the robot dropped the cup is actually just an opportunity for it to practice a different task. Maybe it's an opportunity for it to practice how to pick up the cup. And uh, maybe uh, if, so if it fails a task one, it can attempt task two. And if it succeeds, then maybe it can replace the cup back. And if it fails at that and it spills the coffee, maybe that's an opportunity for it to practice cleaning up the coffee spill. So if you view the world fundamentally as a multitask problem, then actually each failure like this is an opportunity to practice something else. And you don't necessarily need somebody to come in and reset the environment for you. Now, of course, some of these additional things that you might need to practice when you fail might be even harder than the original problem you were trying to solve. But if your goal ultimately is to become very competent at a range of behaviors in the real world, then maybe that's okay. So let me tell you about a project that we did where we actually instantiated this idea. So our goal here was to train a robotic hand to reposition an object in the palm. So the idea is that you have this uh, three-pronged object and you're supposed to perform an in-hand manipulation where the object is repositioned in the palm so that one of the spokes is facing forward and the object is in the middle of the palm. And to set this up, we actually define multiple different tasks. For now, the tasks are defined manually, although in the future, one could imagine learning this. Um, and the idea is that the tasks are defined so that whatever situation the robot can get into, there's some other task that it can practice from that situation. Now, of course, as you might imagine, defining this manually is a little bit limiting because in reality, we might not be able to anticipate all the situations the robot might get into. But in this case, this at least allowed us to shake out this idea of, being a, of using multitask learning to do autonomous training. So the tasks were recentering in, uh, in the workspace, picking something up, flipping it upright, and manipulating it in the hand. And once we define these tasks, and crucially here, the robot doesn't actually know how to do the tasks from the start. It has rewards for them, but it has to learn all of the tasks together. So defining it in this way, we can actually simply switch on the robot and run it for a very long time. This took about 60 hours, but those 60 hours were fully autonomous. So we, we show the clock there just so you can see it. Um, and we start the experiment and the student running the experiment basically goes home and does some homework, uh, gets some sleep. And in the meantime, the robot is working. So it takes a lot of work for the robot, but it's really robot work, not human work. And as it progresses, this set of tasks actually creates a natural curriculum where it first learns how to pick up the object. And then once it's mastered that, then it learns how to reorient it in the hand. And the same concept can be used to learn other tasks, like picking up this pipe connector and connecting it to, um, uh, to the peg in the environment. And here you're going to see that it actually failed the first time, but that's okay. It just uh, executes a different task and then tries again, and then eventually connects the pipe. So the idea here is that if you can learn multiple tasks simultaneously, you can actually allow robots to learn entirely autonomously in the real world. And while that might seem like a fairly mundane thing, it turns out to be a really powerful idea if we really want to unleash the full power of reinforcement learning, which does require training for quite a long time and do so without requiring exorbitant human effort. And we've applied this concept to a number of other settings, including uh, locomotion, where we can get robots to learn to walk by learning how to stand up, uh, mobile manipulation, where robots can clean up a room and they practice by picking up objects and then dropping them back down again so they can practice some more, and as well as other domains. But what I want to talk about in the last portion of today's talk is actually how we can take this idea and combine it with the offline RL concepts that I introduced previously. So the setting here is going to be that we, we really would like to have both parts that I outlined before. We want to have prior knowledge that we're going to use to initialize tasks, and we're going to have this multitask training so that we can train autonomously in the real world. Um, so these, these parts, um, you know, they really go together very well because the prior knowledge can often actually inform how you practice a task. So if you have good prior knowledge, maybe you have almost everything you need to make the training autonomous. So here's how the full system is going to work. We call the system Arial. Um, so the idea is that you have a variety of prior tasks, but these tasks are a little more narrow than in the bridge data set. We're actually currently extending this to the bridge data set, but for now we used a slightly more narrow set of tasks. 
Um, and we're going to learn, just like in the uh, PTR project before, we're going to learn a policy that's conditional on task index, which is denoted by Z here. And then we're going to use this offline data to initialize two policies, a forward policy and a backward policy. We could initialize more, so we could, we could have a full task graph, but for now, we're just going to have a forward and backward task. So if you, you have one task that you want to solve, like placing an object in the drawer, the backward task will be whatever gets you from the completion of that task back to the initial state. Um, so in principle, these two controllers together, if they actually work well, are enough to fully automate the task. But of course, they don't necessarily need to both work well right from the start because we're going to be training them together and they'll improve as the training progresses. And then as we train, we're going to combine new data that's coming in from this autonomous practicing process with some prior data from our prior data sets so that we don't forget. And we can opt uh, optionally also include um, demonstration data to help bootstrap the new task. So if the new task is you know, somewhat structurally similar to the prior tasks that we've seen before, then just initializing from prior data might be enough to get the robot to explore effectively. But if the new task is a sparse reward task that's just too different from what we saw before, so the robot always fails, then we can also include a little bit of demonstration data to just help bootstrap it. And that's optional. Um, so here are uh, some of the uh, prior data that, that is used for the system. So you can see that these are tasks that involve taking and placing objects and putting objects in drawers, that sort of thing. And here's the autonomous training process. And on the left, uh, I'm showing the autonomous training process right at the beginning, and on the right, after 100 trials. And 100 trials, by the way, is not very much for an RL method. So you can see that initially, just the prior data alone is enough to give the robot some sense for how to do the task. Like it's never seen this particular um, shape sorting board before, and it's never seen this particular cube. So it's mostly seen like plates and plots and things like that. So it can't really pick up the cube effectively, but it has the right idea. Like it kind of knows that, well, all of these tasks, you know, it, they, they're going to involve like somehow touching an object and putting it somewhere in the target container. So that's what the prior data gives you. It gives you that, that, that initialization. And then after 100 attempts, then you actually get a pretty decent policy for both the forward and backward direction. And here, here are a variety of other tasks that were learned with the system. And some of these are pretty similar to the prior data. Some of them, like the ring on peg task in the upper right, is actually pretty different. Uh, the more different tasks, like the ring on peg, they are actually bootstrapped with a small number of demonstrations in addition to the prior data to basically overcome the exploration challenge. The demonstrations alone here are not enough to solve the task, so it still needs the autonomous practicing to solve it. And these are all, of course, done with images and with uh, sparse rewards. Now, uh, I want, at this point, to show you a few other examples of other projects that we've done that kind of have a similar principle. So I'm not going to go into quite as much detail about these, but I do want to give you a little bit of a sense for uh, what this was all about. Um, and partly this also illustrates some of the power of uh, offline training and also online fine tuning. So um, at Google, we've been doing quite a bit of work over the last few years on large scale reinforcement learning. This started back in 2018 when we developed the uh, QT Opt system. So uh, QT Opt was a system for uh, deep reinforcement learning of robotic grasping, and it could do grasping from images pretty well. But then more recently, we extended this uh, into a system that we called MTOPT, which learns many different tasks. Uh, in this case, it has 12, 12 training tasks and it fine tunes to new tasks um, using kind of a similar setup. So the tasks are also kind of pick and place style tasks. So there were 12 tasks, thousands of objects, months of data collection. And then after we did this research, we had a new hypothesis. We thought, well, could we learn these same tasks without rewards by using goal conditioned reinforcement learning? And I want to tell you kind of about two things here. One is the first one is the offline RL stuff, which is where it's not really that relevant what the hypothesis exactly is, but it's more about the process. But then I'll tell you about how this hypothesis itself is actually kind of interesting. But let's just start with the kind of the meta thing, the uh, research process question. So if you have if you did this large scale experiment and you have this new hypothesis you want to answer it'd be really appealing to be able to answer this new hypothesis without repeating the months of data collection. And that's really a lot of the power of offline RL is that besides providing a, a nice framework for this uh, system that can utilize prior data, it can simply speed up research by allowing you to resolve these new questions without repeating lengthy data collection processes. So we had this goal conditioned uh, policy that we want to train. It basically takes in a goal image of how the world needs to look and then trains the robot to rearrange the environment. And we actually used exactly the same data to train this goal conditioned policy without any additional data collection. That was actually enough to allow us to do this research. 
which I think is actually pretty, pretty cool because generally, if you're doing real world robotic learning research, just collecting the data needed to, to do this can be a major obstacle. So, uh, but, but now let me talk about the goal conditioned uh, stuff itself. So the goal conditioned policy that we trained from this data, from the MTOP data, worked pretty well. So in the lower right, you can see the goal image that was given to the robot. And in the upper right, uh, you can see what the, robot, what the robot is seeing through its camera. So here, the goal image was to have the hand holding the porn, and the robot picks up the porn. Here, the goal image has the hand holding the broccoli, and it picks up the broccoli. Uh, next, we're going to have some slightly harder ones. So here in the goal image, the carrot is on the plate, and it figures out that to accomplish this goal, it needs to actually pick up the carrot. And you'll notice that it actually takes a little bit of time to reposition the gripper so that it gets the carrot into the right spot. Here, there's a banana on the plate. So again, it kind of uh, figures out how to drop the banana to get it in the right spot. Here are the uh, broccoli has been added to the bowl. And again, it, it does that correctly. Here, the banana was moved to be close to the carrot. And it actually makes a few attempts to reposition the banana until it's kind of close enough. So, so it has a little bit of a perfectionist streak to it where it'll actually keep trying to reposition the thing to get it closer and closer. Um, now, this is interesting because these tasks are learned without any reward function at all. The task is defined entirely using goal images. It uses uh, a conservative offline RL method that's similar to CQL in principle. And it works very well, actually, as an unsupervised pre-training objective. So besides the fact that we can get these goal condition policies, the other really nice thing we can do with this is that we can pre-train the policy with uh, the, this goal condition training, which can use any data and doesn't require hand-specified reward functions. And then we can fine-tune it with a task reward and get it to learn much more efficiently. So here in these curves, the blue curve shows what happens when we include the uh, auxiliary goal reaching. And the orange is what happens if we're just trying to train the task from scratch. And you can see that it trains a lot faster by using this goal condition pre-training. So that's kind of cool. It's almost like a, a kind of a self-supervised method for robotics, like a kind of like a robotics version of BERT in some sense. OK, uh, but just to wrap up and uh, conclude, I, I talked about how if we want embodied learning systems that can successfully learn in real world settings like that uh, desert island, we need to be able to incorporate prior knowledge to get us bootstrapped, and we need to learn autonomously in the real world. And I talked about how incorporating prior knowledge can be accomplished with offline RL, how the autonomous training can be accomplished by means of multitask learning, and how these two parts can be put together uh, to yield effective robotic learning systems. So offline RL provides us with a tool to reuse data in robotics while still optimizing for highly performed behaviors. Multitask learning makes it much easier to train autonomously in the real world, and we can effectively use offline RL with real world data including for multitask training, pre-training, and of course, online fine tuning. Now, there is a lot more to be done here. We're still in the early stages of the journey from reinforcement learning to embodied learning. And while we have initial prototypes that kind of, kind of have all the pieces, uh, I think the pieces themselves can be a lot better. You know, our ability to utilize prior data is still a little bit restricted. Like, you know, everything I showed has prior data from the same robot. It might be really interesting to think about how to use observational data. It might be really interesting to how to use uh, data from a much broader range of different embodiments, tool use, that sort of thing. And of course, the online fine tuning is still limited in that while the multitask formulation allows us to deal with the autonomy problem, it still doesn't really account for things like safety. It doesn't really account for uh, very well for figuring out what not to do uh, without jumping off the cliff example from before. So there are many open problems uh, that still need to be tackled to make this truly effective to really enable the robot to survive on that desert island. But the point that I want to really conclude on here is why we should work on these problems. And this is, you know, obviously the answer will be different for, for, for everybody, but I, I just want to tell you a little bit about my reasons. Like basically, why is this interesting? Why should this be interesting to us? And why is it interesting to me? Well, for me, it's really exciting to see what solutions intelligent agents can come up with. And perhaps the most rewarding uh, part of the research is when they come up with solutions that we didn't entirely expect. But this requires that our embodied agents inhabit environments that really admit novel solutions. Like there's only so many ways to play a video game, especially a simple video game. But if you put a robot into the real world, there might be a million ways that it can solve a given problem. And the particular way that it comes up with might actually surprise you. And I think that's really the most exciting part that if we situate our embodied agents in sufficiently complicated open world settings, they'll come up with ways to solve problems that we ourselves didn't even expect. So to see interesting emergent behavior, we have to train our systems in environments that actually require interesting emergent behavior, like the real world. And to do that, we need to overcome these challenges that deal with incorporating prior knowledge to get us bootstrapped so that training is reasonable in terms of cost, and to make the training autonomous so that it's practical to actually run it in the real world. So RL in the real world may be very difficult, 
And there may be many technical challenges beyond the standard RL formulation, but I think it's also much more rewarding in many ways. So I'd like to thank the students that carried out this research. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I, I think we have some time for questions, so I'd be happy to take questions at this point.